Amen. All glory to God. Well, brothers and sisters, I invite you this evening to take your copy of God's Word and open to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. The Gospel of John, chapter 2. If you're using the black hardback Bible in front of the seat uh, in front of you, it will be on page 1054. And we will commence reading in verse 13 of John chapter 2. Let us hear now the word of the living God. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It had taken forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about men, for he himself knew what was in men. Amen. Thus far, the reading of God's inerrant word, and let us now seek his face in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening and we thank you that you have given, this, given us this opportunity to gather together as your people to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, for the peace that we can enjoy even now in these walls to worship you and to know your presence among us. And we do pray, Lord, that you would be among us. And as we seek to understand your word, that by your spirit, spirit you would enlighten our minds and our understanding, that we would be able to receive your word and obey your word as you have instructed it to us. Help us, Lord, now as we seek to understand, give us hearts to receive, give us wills to obey, that we would worship you and honor you even as the word of God is preached. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in our passage this evening, we find our Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. He is here at his first Passover feast. And the first thing we see him doing, as we read from verse 13, is cleanse the temple of all the defilement that was there. It's a very familiar scene to many of us. But it's also a very violent and a graphic scene that Makes uh, where Christ makes here a, a whip of cords and drives out those who are selling animals for sacrifice and overturns the tables of, of those who are exchanging money to those who are coming and, and visiting and bringing their sacrifices to the temple. He says that the zeal of the Lord is consuming him as he seeks to cleanse the temple of the commercializing of what is the house of prayer. And after this uh, scene, there is uh, another very familiar scene and event that takes place in John chapter 3. It's the story of Nicodemus. Most of you know that event as well. Jesus talks to Nicodemus who comes to him by night and seeks to understand something of the power that he demonstrates in his miracles. But in between those two well-known stories, the cleansing of the temple and the discourse with Nicodemus, the Apostle John makes an important commentary that joins those two 
narratives together. And it's found in verses 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. The title of the message this evening is Saving Faith. Now, we all know that salvation is by faith and faith alone. And the unmerited grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe, as John 3.16 says, that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that all those who believe in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But the question we want to ask this evening is, what is this faith that brings some, someone to salvation? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? John the evangelist tells the goal of his gospel account in, in John 20, 31, and he says that his goal is that you might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so it is absolutely vital for us to understand what it means to believe in such a way that would lead us to eternal life. Because at the very beginning, you hear at the gospel, in the Gospel of John, we see that there is a kind of faith that does not save. In fact, throughout the, the Gospel of John, you will find, and we'll look at many of the passages, this theme of saving faith runs all throughout. There are those who believe, but apparently their faith is not saving. It's not the real thing. Now, for some today, and really for many today, it's a really uncomfortable notion to think of a faith that really is not saving. People say faith is faith, and that's the end of that. Right? Any kind of self-examination, any kind of discernment of whether your faith is genuine is often termed as legalism. And you will hear uh, many times, uh, every Lord's Day around our nation, preachers, pastors calling people to just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but never really going beyond that and explaining what it means to believe. What it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how can we discern whether our faith is genuine? You see, it's often not what is said, but what is not said that exposes a, a compromised stance on the Word of God. But if you are to deal honestly with the Word of God, the inerrant Word of God, you, you must recognize that again and again, this theme of saving and unsaving faith come, comes up in the Word of God. And especially here in the Gospel of John. We see a faith that ultimately does not bring spiritual life. A faith that will ultimately not be accepted in the sight of God. In fact, notice in, in verse 24 where it is said when the many believe in Jesus and Jesus responds and it says that, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them. Now that word entrust is essentially the same root word that was used of the many people believing in Jesus. And so you could say that Jesus didn't believe their believing, or Jesus did not trust their trusting. So why is it that Jesus did not entrust himself to these people? For there are people to whom he had entrusted himself. We know in chapter 1 that he entrusted himself to Nathanael. He says in verse 47, Behold an Israelite, indeed in whom there is no deceit. Jesus entrusted himself to Nathanael. Jesus entrusted himself to his disciples. He entrusted himself to the Samaritan woman at the well. And so what would cause Christ not to entrust himself to these many people who, notice, believed in his name? Now that's a very strong expression, isn't it? They did not just merely believe in the abstract, but it says they believed in his name. 
We will re la later read of the disciples casting out demons in his name and giving sight to the blind in his name. And even, and even again, the, the Gospel of John, the goal is that by believing, John says, you may have life in his name. And yet it appears that you can believe in his name and yet not have life in his name. So the question we want to answer is, what is saving faith? But before we do that, I want to consider with you briefly some characteristics of a counterfeit faith. A faith that might appear to be saving on the surface level, but that which will ultimately not be saving. That will ultimately not be accepted in the sight of God. And here are three characteristics. Now I remind you again, right, Jesus is here in Jerusalem. He has just cleansed the temple. And you might ask yourself, why would anybody believe in such a man who has so violently disrupted the peace in the city? After upsetting business and social norms and questioning the authority, and then, and then making such a provocative statement as destroy this temple and I will raise it up in, in three days. Why would anybody believe in him? Were the Jews just looking for a political revolutionary? One who feared no man and who had no regard for the current religious establishment? Well, not exactly. Uh, the Jews were looking for, for a revolutionary of some sort that would free them from Roman oppression, but... They were not looking for somebody who would question the religious practice of the day. The answer really is right there on the surface in verse 23 of chapter 2. They saw the signs. They saw the signs. You see, a counterfeit faith is motivated by the spectacular or that which is external. We read in John chapter 6, verse 14, a very similar thing is said. When the people saw the signs that he had done, that's the feeding of the 5,000, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Or later in John seven thirty one, yet many of the people we read believed in him. And they said, when the Christ appears, will he not do more signs than this man has done? You see, they believed in him, but they did not believe in him as the Messiah, as the Christ. He was but a miracle worker for them. You see, people will always run after the spectacular. People will always run after that which draws a crowd, that which excites the external senses of our bodies. Nicodemus was such a man. We read about him in chapter 3. He comes to Jesus by night as he also saw the signs. And he even tells him that no one can do these things unless God be with him. He acknowledges the power that is in Christ. And yet, remember what Jesus responds to him. He says, you, you must be born again, Nicodemus. Nicodemus thought that he was all right as far as it went. And he was just looking for a little more insight into the power of Christ really being excited by what he saw, but not really looking beyond that, and not lo really looking to Christ in the fuller sense of who he is and what he has come to do. And so you see, a non-saving faith is often characterized by that which stimulates our external senses, but does not move much deeper than that. And isn't much of the modern-day worship of the church very similar to this? Now, I'm not saying that there is no saving faith, but if you think of how much worship has become visually driven, you think of our Protestant forefathers who had worked so hard to, to cleanse the church of the external worship of Roman Catholicism with all its relics and candles and priests and so on and so forth, all this external worship, and to focus simply on, on, the, on the Word of God. And yet now, today, we see more and more worship being driven by, by the external, uh, by that which excites the eye, the ear. 
because that's what draws the crowd. That's what people want to hear. And so a non-saving faith, a counterfeit faith, is motivated by the external and the spectacular. But notice also, a non-saving faith is oriented on the immediate benefits that Christ brings. What kind of signs did Jesus do? Well, largely, he was doing healings. He was casting out demons. He, he was healing massive crowds, or he was feeding massive crowds of people. He was bringing people real temporal relief right we don't want to dismiss the signs they were genuine signs from god to validate the ministry of our lord but the signs were never an end unto themselves the signs were there to to point to the greater message of the cross to the person of christ who he is what he is to accomplish but as is often the case The benefits of Christ eclipse the person of Christ. And we see this among the Jews as well. They believed in him for the signs that he had done. The benefits that they could have received from him. Consider the word of faith movement today. Very much characterized by this very same idea. That God promises you health and wealth if you just have enough power or enough faith to unleash that power of God. And so you have these revival meetings and people come and they pray in earnest that God would give them power over their demons and over their sins and over their health and over their finances and, and yet nothing comes of that. And yet they do not want a Christ who, who says that my power is made perfect in weakness, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And so in the final analysis, you see that they are desiring the power of Christ, the benefit of Christ, but not the person of Christ. They are not desiring Christ himself. And so this faith will ultimately not be saving because Christ is not received in whole. It is a counterfeit faith motivated by the external, oriented on the gift rather than the giver. And lastly, notice, by implication... This counterfeit counterfeit faith is a faith that does not last. Or simply, it's temporary. You you can think of this as that second and and third soil in the parable of the sower. Particularly in our passage, it's more of that second rocky soil that is described here. Matthew 13, 20 says that as of what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, word and immediately receives it. Right? Receiving the word, that's, that's faith. Even with joy. But, verse 21, he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And so we read that many believed in Jesus in Jerusalem. But they, but they did not last. How do we know this? Well, there's nothing said about them becoming his disciples. Nothing said about them following after him. They saw the signs. They believed that there is this miracle worker amongst us, but it didn't change their lives. They went on to live their lives as they always did. And so it is some species of faith, right? There is something that is believed here. It doesn't doesn't even say that it's a false faith, faith altogether, but it is not a saving faith. Because the ultimate test of saving faith, at least as, at least as we can perceive it in others, is, is perseverance. Uh, out of these three qualities, it is particularly this test of perseverance that demonstrates whether somebody's faith is, is genuine. Now, I can't know the, and discern your heart whether you're motivated merely by the external, or whether you're seeking more the gift of Christ than Christ himself. But you know what I can tell is whether you're persevering. Whether you believe in Christ today as you claim to believe in him 5, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, this is why, brothers and sisters, we must not make so much, uh, em- put so much emphasis on the time and place when we believed or made a public profession of faith sometime in the past as the ground of our salvation. But the question is, Am I believing today? 
Am I trusting Christ today? Or is my faith temporary? A very vivid example of this is found in John chapter 8. Why don't you open there with me? John chapter 8, verse 30. Jesus has many discourses uh, in these sections with, with the Jews. And we read in verse 30 of John chapter 8, as he was saying these things, again, many believed in him. In verse 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, right? These are the same people. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you know what happens? By, by the end of that chapter, by the end of that discourse, those same Jews, right? The, the many who believed, we read in verse 59, they pick up stones to throw at him. What a churn of events. They believed, but it was not for very long. In fact, their, their belief turned into hatred. And we read even in Hebrews chapter 6 that there can be people who have been enlightened, who have even tasted of the heavenly gift of salvation and the power of the age to come, and yet their faith is not saving. Why? Because it doesn't last. It doesn't last. And so we ask again, what is saving faith? What is saving faith? Well, we could, of course, just take these three characteristics of non-saving faith and flip them around and look at saving faith in, in, from that light. But I want to take a bit of a different approach and consider saving faith with you from the three primary faculties of our soul. Three primary faculties of our soul. And it begins with our mind. Saving faith trusts in the objective truth of the gospel. Truth is at the center, right? You, you can't believe something you have no comprehension or awareness of. Now, there must be some understanding of the truth of God's word, the truth of the gospel. Who is God? He is the creator of the universe. He created me and you and everything that exists. He is the holy, the righteous, and just God. You need to know something about the nature of man and his fallen state in particular. He is an image bearer of God, but he has fallen. And in sin, he rebels against God. He does not love God by nature. And then, of course, you need to know something about the person of Christ and, and the work of Christ. Who is he? What has he come to accomplish? Now, for the Jews, to a large extent at this time, you know, they had not, no issue of believing many of the parts of the gospel. They, they believed in the God of Scripture. They believed that man was sinful. They even believed we see and were persuaded of the power of Christ and the miracles of Christ. They didn't doubt, doubt his power. And in some sense, they had a, a real faith, but it wasn't complete. It wasn't saving. Why? Well, again, we look here and we see that they, did, that they didn't believe in the person of Christ as he truly is. And one of those characteristics or one of those attributes which they did not believe regarding Christ is that he knows all things. As we read in verse 24, and 25, he knew all men and knew was that, that which was even in men that he did not need anybody to testify regarding men. No man can know what is in the heart of men. Do you know what is in the heart of men? Many are asking today what is in the heart of Putin. But nobody really knows what's in the heart of Putin. Not even those who are closest to him. Have you ever been surprised by somebody who's close to you in your life doing something and you said, I can't believe they did that. I know them. I know them better than that. You see, man cannot know what is in the heart of man. The most wise of men can only discern based on appearance, based on what people say, based on how people act. You take Solomon, for example, the wisest man of the Bible who wrote much of the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. 
And you find that Solomon in, in all of his writings, the best he can do is give us advice based on outward appearance and outward actions. Solomon didn't know what's in the heart of man. Remember when the two women came to him and both claiming to be the mother of that living child, what did Solomon have to do? He had to run a test to come to some kind of a reasonable conclusion as to whose child it was. But you know what? Jesus knows all things. Jesus knows all things from beginning to end. We read in chapter 1 of John again with Nathaniel. Nathaniel asks him, how do you know me? And Jesus says before, Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Or think of the discussion Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at the well. He exposes to her her heart and her adultery and points her to her sin, things that she did not confess to him. But of course, Jesus knows more than just certain events in time and and history. Jesus, and only Jesus as the God-man, knows what is truly in the heart of man. He knows whether your faith is saving or not. He knows whether you truly believe in him or not. And of course, this testifies of, of his divinity. Only God can know what is in man. Only God is omniscient. And this is the Jesus in which, in whom we have to believe. Right? The Jesus who is revealed in Scripture to us as the one who knows all things. And, and we embrace this truth. Saving faith embraces this truth with the mind. I comprehend it. I understand it. I believe it. But beyond that, saving faith also embraces Christ with the heart. Not only must there be a a mental ascent to the truth of Scripture and the truth of the gospel, but there must be an internal love for Christ. The one who puts their trust in Christ is, is the one who finds Christ to be altogether lovely, altogether desirable. Now, this is, brothers and sisters, where we often fall short, I think, especially in our rationalistic 20th century that especially is comfortable with speaking of of things that are easily verifiable and objectively provable. And this experiential aspect of the Christian life can get lost. This experiential dimension of saving faith can become lost. That's why we speak so often of justification, and we should, but maybe so little of regeneration which in fact precedes justification. You must be born again. Again, remember the the discourse with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Regeneration precedes faith. And only as you are born again, as you are given a new heart, can you place your faith in Christ. Before we were dead in our sins, we hated God. We hated Christ. We hated his word and his commandments. But when the Holy Spirit comes and enlightens our understanding and revives our hearts, what happens? We begin to love the things of God. We begin to love the things of Christ. The gospel not only makes sense to you, as you could comprehend that even before you're born again, uh, you can understand the gospel. But the gospel then has power over your lives. This new life that the Spirit of God brings, brings within our hearts a love for Christ, a desire for Him. So that when we repent and when we place our faith in Christ, that faith is driven by love for Christ. You know the difference between trust and love? Well, in one sense, Trust is, is something that is more cognitive, right? You, you heard the truth and you trust that it is accurate and reliable. But love is something that has more to do with our affections and our desires. We, we trust Christ and we lay hold of Christ by faith when we trust Him with our minds, yes, but 
we also lay hold of Christ by love in our hearts when we look to him as the one who is desirable to our souls. The one who really satisfies the desires of our hearts, our renewed hearts. Romans 5.5 5 says, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, God's love is poured out into our hearts and we are made new creatures in Christ and because of that we can love. We've known something of God's love and therefore we too can love. Or consider Romans 8, 28, very familiar to most of us. And we know that for those who what? Trust God? No, it says for those who love God, all things work together for good. It is not to dismiss trust, right? But notice when these words are used. Notice how love is used. Notice how trust is used. 1 Corinthians 2.9 But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. And 1 Corinthians 8.3 But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. You see, saving faith has this and must have this experiential dimension. There is this affection for Christ himself. It's not just an intellectual trust in certain propositional truths. There is a love for God, a love for Christ. Consider James 1.12. Here James speaks of life that is given to those who love God. Again, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, who has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. The crown of life. This is the same idea as John speaks of the life that is given in his name. To those who love God to those who love Christ. Wholehearted devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of Ruth as she clung to Naomi. She said, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She's willing to give up all because of the God of Israel, the true God of Scripture. And notice, it's not just a love, again, for the truth of Scripture. It's not just a love for, for certain um, propositions or doctrines of Scripture or the harmony of Scripture as a whole or Christian tradition or, or the Christian way of life. No, it's, it's a love for Christ himself, a love for, for God himself in all of his offices, in all of his precepts, a love for Christ. Here's how the Apostle Paul describes it and, and prays for the church and in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, he prays that, our, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. The love of God, the love of Christ has been shed abroad within our hearts and how can we then not love him in return. And so you see, saving faith cannot be without love. It trusts the gospel message, the propositional truth that God has revealed in his word, but it's accompanied by this true affection and love for Christ. And that's why, brothers and sisters, when we call people to, to believe in Jesus Christ, as we evangelize and, and witness we are not to only call people to trust in Christ. We should also be calling people to love Christ, to see him as the one who is the most desirable one to our souls, the one who, who we can delight in, the one who we can rejoice in. Here's the difference between dead orthodoxy that only rests on propositional truth and experiential Christianity that receives Christ in love with the heart. And now finally, saving faith not only receives Christ with the mind, 
and the heart, but it also receives Christ with the will. See, saving faith is not merely a a passive acceptance of the truth or some kind of a mystical experience of God. No, saving faith also involves our will. Every faculty of man must be involved and is engaged in saving faith, right? The Puritans spoke of it as head, heart, and hand. Our understanding, our affections, and our will. And this is the case in all things that we do. Don't you realize you, you act by what you believe and by what you desire? Just take, take Eve, for example, in Genesis 3.6 and that first sin. What happened there? Well, we read that she saw that the tree was good, right? She had some understanding of its goodness to the eye. But then we read that she desired it with her heart and then took of it, right? That's her will, especially her will. So when we think of saving faith, it is especially invoked, I want you to notice, by the will. Just think of what is the call of the gospel? What is the call of the gospel? We say, come to Christ. Jesus says, come to me all who are heavy laden, who are labored, and I will give you rest. We just sung this morning our first hymn. Come ye needy, come and welcome. God's free bounty glorify. True belief and true repentance. Every grace that brings you nigh. Without money, without money, come to Jesus Christ and buy. You see, coming is identified with placing your faith in Christ. This is the will. The will comes to Christ. Jesus said in John 5, 39, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that testify about me. Yet, verse 40, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. They believe in scriptures, in the scriptures. They believe in the objective truth of God's word, and yet they refuse to come. They refuse to believe. Their will was not ready. They were not ready to commit. And this is very important. You see, commitment, commitment is, is a particular char- characterization of the engagement of the will. Commitment is that particular characterization that engages a will. Such that saving faith shows itself through commitment. Notice again in, in John chapter 13. Why don't you open there with me? John chapter 13. How Jesus describes this, this same reality. In verse 42. Very sobering words for us here. John 13, verse 42. Now many of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. And in verse 43, for they loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. They believed. But they did not confess or you can say that they they did not commit and so jesus did not entrust himself to them but saving faith commits with the will bb warfield says that it is an absolute transference of trust from ourselves to the other a complete self-surrender to christ no reserve a full surrender to christ That's why, brothers and sisters, our obedience and and good works are inevitable with saving faith. They are not saving faith themselves, but but they are inevitable because our will must be engaged. When we read that faith without works is dead, it's not only true because that's what Scripture says and because that's the example we see in Scripture, but the truth is behind, behind that is that it reflects our constitution as human beings, head, heart, and hand. Whatever we think and whatever we think upon is what we will desire. And what we desire is that which, will we, which we will act upon. Every time. All the time. 
Even if you think you have exceptions, talk to me and I'll prove to you that no, it's actually you always do what you truly desire and what you truly think is the right thing for you to do. And so saving faith takes hold of Christ with the whole being. Here again, the words of Christ in John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Saving faith doesn't pick and choose what it will obey and from the precepts and the commandments of God and Christ. No, it, in humility, it receives with joy all that Christ is and all that he reveals to us that we are to obey and how we are to live. This is why, brothers and sisters, we, we should pause Oftentimes, we we're so, could be so anxious when we hear a, a new profession of faith to, to dub that person a, as a true believer, not giving it time to realize itself and the fruit that comes out of that life. Here's what Whitefield, Whitfield said. He says, this makes me cautious now, right, this, this reality that there must be fruit, which, was not, which I was not 30 years ago of dubbing converts too soon. I love now to wait a little and see if people bring forth fruit. For there are so many blossoms with March winds that are blown away that I cannot believe they are converts till I see fruit brought back. It will never do a sincere soul any harm to wait. And brothers and sisters, this is one of the ways that we can know that ultimately Nicodemus did possess saving faith. How so? Well, because his, his actions showed it. He was the one who was willing to take a stance for Christ in, in the most dangerous and the least popular of times. And he was the one who was willing to, to pay great money to anoint his body for, for burial. That is, that is the fruit of, of a saving faith. And it engages our will. And so let me ask you this evening, have you laid hold of Christ with your mind, with your heart, and with your will? Do you believe in him as he has revealed himself in Scripture, as the God-man who has come into this world to die for sinners, as the one who had fulfilled all the prophecies concerning him from the Old Testament? And who rose on the third day for our justification? And do you take hold of him with your heart and see him as the one who is most desirable, precious, most valuable than anything this world can ever offer you? And with your will, such that you are willing to go after him, follow him wherever he may lead. If you do, Dear brother or sister, these are signs that you have genuine saving faith. Well, my dear friend, if you are here this evening and, and you cannot and honest say that about yourself, I want you to know that today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your heart, but receive this truth. Come to Jesus Christ. Believe in Him with your head and your heart and your hand. And find him to be the perfect Savior that he promises to be to all those who come after him. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, how precious and true is your word. And how good it is to know that we can know you through, your, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we praise you for the truth of the gospel. We praise you, Lord, for, for the beauty of the gospel. How you work unlike men, and you take the lowly and the weak of this world to exalt your own name and give glory and praise to your own name. We thank you, Lord, that in saving sinners, you are so gracious and kind to not only change our minds, but to change our hearts. 
and change our, change our affections, change our desires to love Christ, to desire Christ, to worship Christ, and to live for Christ. We thank you for the new heart that you give us to, to live in obedience according to your word. And yet, Lord, we, we do confess that so often we lose sight of this great truth and we can disobey and with our affections we can stray and, and look for other things and with our minds think upon other things. Oh Lord, forgive us. Renew in us a, a new hope, a new trust, a new love for the Savior. And we pray, Lord, for the unconverted, those who are still lost and perishing, maybe those who are living with a false perception of faith even tonight, that you would convict their hearts, that you would open their minds to receive Christ in his fullness, receive Christ with their understanding, with their hearts and with their wills. And help us, Lord, as we go to our places, our, our places of work, our homes, that as we seek to bear, bear witness of Christ, that we would truly present him in his fullness, in his beauty, and in his power. We pray all this in his lovely and wonderful name. Amen.